I'm liking that flute there. Like, yeah, getting kind of packed up in here. <laughs> chill vibe, like chill, but like we're on a mission. We are. Yeah. Got the band welcome. back. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. We're on episode 22, Pocket Deuces. Uh, Jason and myself here today, we're going to talk about a topic that, um, you know, yeah, everybody, everybody talks about the idea of failures um, and how they're necessary, but oh, I hope, hope that uh, it's hard to be transparent with these failures, but we're going to hope that we can be as uh, transparent as we can with you know, peeling back some of the onion layers and some of the failures I know that I've encountered um, and Jason yourself. So failures. Um First, sure. I, want to, I want to start. Um, I think that, and I've really thought this recently, every great character trait that I personally feel that I have has formed from a failure. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny that you say that, right? So I was just thinking, you know, one of the biggest failures I ever had, right? So episode 22, right? When I was in the uh, like Pee Wee football, little D League, whatever, or whatever, you know, the small, the first year that you can go, <clears throat> my number was 22, right? And uh, one of the biggest failures that I had was it was the playoffs, right? And I was like the starting running back, did really well, right? And uh, I woke up for the playoff game and I had like that butterfly in the belly, right? And I thought I was sick. And, you know, told myself, oh, I'm too sick to play or whatever. And it was just like, you know, that fear and anxiety and all that kind of stuff that builds up into you. And I didn't go. And we ended up, uh, you know, the, uh, right on the opening kickoff, the team ran the kickback for a touchdown and we lost six to nothing. And my dad pointed out, like, that was the spot that you were supposed to be in to make the play. Right. Oh, Not only yeah. was I like the starting running back, but he told me like that. So ever since then, anytime I get like nerves or, you know, any kind of anxiety in my stomach, as far as like public speaking or any, anything that, you know, you're scared to do, I'm like, fuck it, I'm doing it. Cause I'm not going to let the team down again after that, you know? So it was super humbling moment. Um, it's ironic that we're talking about this on episode 22, but, uh, it just brought flashbacks back and, uh, you know, letting the team down and let myself down. And then, you know, once the game was over, I realized like, oh, I feel fine, you know, but before that, I was just like, what, what is this? You know, I, I don't know. I was probably like eight years old or something like that. You know, you, you didn't really know what was going on, but ever since that, I'm like, no, it was fucking something internal that was making me, you know, scared or nervous or feeling like physically sick or whatever. And then it went away. I'm like, well, oh, fuck, you know, yeah, it's amazing how much you can physically manifest from a mental problem. You know, not pro you know what I'm, I mean, you know what I'm saying. Like, like I I so I have a peanut allergy, tree nuts, whatever nuts. I'm allergic to to nuts, and uh, you know, for a time it was even more than that. Like when I when I was growing, we thought it was corn and potato and soy. And I still have somewhat of a shellfish allergy, but that's 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 not that bad. But anyway, like all these things, and I got it crazy phobia from it um it was like just just because the fear of not being able to breathe i mean you know like it's it, it, you get like a different chill when you have an allergic reaction or at least i heard about it and then i got it or maybe i manifested it because i read it but <laughs> uh like it's like a hot chill like it's like a hot flash chill but it's different it's it's i've only experienced it whenever i at least think i'm having an allergic reaction so anyway the point is is like i and, and it's a little bit of a separate subject kind of um actually no this is relevant ah this is relevant I'll, I'll make it hit home but i learned that i actually from like yes let's say the nut allergy is real obviously i believe it is i also that's 20 percent of the problem because the 80 percent was the phobia that i had that triggered real physical symptoms that i would have you know like let's keep it simple for everybody here increased heart rate. Like you can, you can do that with anxiety, like easy, right? That's a physical symptom from a mental situation, right? Yeah. So 
I would have real things occur from me thinking that I'm having a reaction, right? So what I, my way, and everybody's journey is different. Everybody's solutions are different. You know, the, you know what works for me may not work for you, but what worked for me was going, you know what, like, because I knew if you made it past like five minutes, you weren't gonna, you weren't really having an anaphylactic shock reaction. You know, your throat wasn't swollen up. So I like, if I'd make it like to five minutes or so, I'd be like, go ahead, like kill me. Like, cause you're not going to, I know you're not cause I've been past five minutes. So you're full of shit body. Like I would just tell him like, it was just, that's how I handled it. Yeah. But like, and now how to bring that home is like, I think it, it's weird. Cause I've actually never thought about this until right now, but I think learning how to deal with like your mind is making this worse than it is from an a food allergy translated directly into a lot of the things that I I do. And, and real estate is one of those where it's like, or just entrepreneurism where you take on major level risk and your mind can make it out to be way worse than it is. But if you can come back down and, and, and now my solution there is similar to the allergy thing where I was like, well, go ahead, kill me. Like I made it five minutes for me. Now it's, I literally visualize where I'm going to sleep tonight. Even if I'm like at a conference and, and I know, but I know my hotel room, like I know where the bed is. Right. And I, I like literally go, no matter what happens today, as long as I don't get put in jail, I will be sleeping tonight. Most likely <laughs> in that spot that I'm visualizing right now. Yeah. Right. And it like eases my anxiety. Does that make sense? Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's always good things like a different focal point, right. Uh, you know, taking your mind off it. Um, you know, I've read about a lot of things with different like stress and anxiety and different ways to overcome it and kind of, you know, regrouping and recentering yourself or keeping your mind off certain things or, you know, different triggers like, uh, you know, the one post I had was like, you're stressed because you have decisions to make that you haven't made. Same thing with anxiety, which is on the other side, of that, right? So there's some kind of thing that you've been putting off or whatever, or that's about to come that you're, you know, if you just hit it head on, it'd be a lot less painful for everybody, right? But the worry buffalo. and the fear about it or whatever, huh? The buffalo. And it's so funny because I, I, I was telling my daughter this story recently uh, because uh, I forget why, but she, the buffalo, right? Like they, they didn't run with the storms. They ran into the storms and they actually experienced the storm for less time because they ran at it, right? Everybody's, or if you haven't heard it there, you've heard this, the two second summary, but like, I was telling my daughter this to, to handle something. Um, and I was laughing because like I wasn't doing it <laughs> with some work stuff. Like, yeah, like we had we had some uh some rough numbers for the team this year. And uh, you know, I wasn't I was like scared to talk to Brittany about it, you know. And um what I was doing was I was extending that storm because now the conversation is always gonna be the conversation, you're gonna have the conversation no matter what. Yeah. But now I'm also having the fear and the anxiety. You know? So I'm like, I'm increasing the time I'm dealing with the storm as opposed to just running into the storm. Yeah. Like, well, here's what you're doing. You know, you keep making these mental pictures in your head of the worst possible outcome that could possibly happen. And you know what I mean? And it's like, if you just do the thing that you're putting off and run into that storm, you know, you'll find exactly what's going to happen. However, it's going to shake out one way or another. You're going to find out right then and there. And then all these what ifs or the unknown stuff that can kind of get your word and staying up all night and all that kind of stuff is over, you know? So now I like that, you know, like I said, if there's a tough conversation that you have to have with a staff member or team member or, you know, kids or wife and or family or whatever, you know, you're better off just getting it out of the way and, you know, putting the cards on the table and like, Hey, look at this is where we're at. This is what happened to cause that. And then, you know, all right, well, this is what we're going to do to make it better, you know, and they're going to have, like you said, every action has a reaction. So they're going to have a reaction to whatever you just told them, which is natural, you know, so it might be worse than others. Right. But at least you'll find out exactly what that reaction is. It's like, okay, well, you know, most of the time it's a lot, a lot, not worse than we, we thought. And when you stay in the truth and you're grounded in the truth, you know, all will shake out the way it should. Um, and, and in some cases it's bad, by the way, like, <laughs> like I, I was saying that I was having a conversation the other day. It's, um, you know, um, going through a tough conversation led to things that I had to deal with 
that are in a sense almost punishment feeling for the the bad thing that happened and it's like well yeah you know you should like in the case it wasn't telling the truth well i should have told the truth if you tell the truth <laughs> yeah. You don't have to face the consequence, but if you if you don't tell the truth, well, you did a bad thing, and it, you know, and they're like, oh, don't be hard on yourself. It's like, well, no, like think about it. Like, if a kid does something bad, you don't give them candy because if you give them candy for doing something bad, they're going to redo the bad thing. It's you know, so we literally like, and and we we put fancy words around shit because we're adults now and we make it sound cool and we talk our way out of shit. But it, we are we're still kids. We're the same thing. You can't give us candy for doing something bad. We need you know, accountability and the repercussions, you know, it doesn't mean that you need to sit in that and go, I'm terrible. Well, you need to go, okay, I feel this pain because I made a mistake. Now I'm yeah. going to not do that again. And I'm going to do the next right thing from here. Right. For sure. <clears throat> kind of uh, reminds me of the book that I just read, uh, Whale Done, Ken Blanchard. Uh, Matt Smith recommended it to me, but, you know, basically the gist of it is, you know, and kind of, right close to your heart in Orlando Sea World, right? Uh, Shamu and all the killer whales in the show. Like, how do they get, you know, these killer whales to be, behave a certain way, right? So, you know, what they do is there's, a, I mean, there's a whole thing with the book, but a lot of it's either redirecting the behavior that you see towards what you want the outcome to be and then reinforcing and, you know, kind of like accentuating the positive. So praising the things that you want to see instead of the gotcha uh, method of as uh, far as, uh, oh, you did that, oh, you're, you're, you're doing wrong, right? And all we do is kind of catch everybody doing the wrong thing and, you know, blast them and everybody's on pins and needles instead of saying like, hey, great job. And, you know, kind of, uh, you know, motivating them through the positive behaviors, even if it's not the best, you can still praise you know, the progress, progress over perfection. So what they do is, um, you know, they're trying to get these killer whales to jump over like these ropes and stuff and jump out of the water and, you know, put on a show, right? How do you get them to do that? So at first, let's start by putting a piece of rope underneath the water. And anytime the whale goes underneath the rope, they kind of ignore it, let it go or whatever. But every time they go over that rope, then they encourage them and then play with them and give them food and all that kind of stuff. So they're praising the behavior that they want, right? And then they slowly just keep raising the rope up, right? Until eventually, you know, they're fucking jumping out and doing flips or whatever the hell they do, you know what I mean? I saw the show uh, a long time ago in SeaWorld, but basically that's it. So praise the progress, redirect, you know, if they're not doing the right thing, you know, they show them the behavior that they want to do and then kind of go from there. So we could all kind of learn from our failures, but, you know, a parenting thing that I've been trying to implement is, you know, the reinforcing the positive, you know, like with my daughter, she's 13, the room's fucking pigsty, right? You know, so trying to say, hey, look at, hey, great job, you know, your, your, your room looks a lot better. Instead, instead of saying like, hey, your room's pigsty, how do you live like that? You know what I mean? Like, please take out all your old garbage and all your old cups and all this junk that you have in there. You know, and it seems to be working. Like, is it perfect? No. But is there a lot of conflict and stuff when you when you kind of train to that or whatever? No, it's, you know, who's going to get mad when you say, hey, it's getting better. Good job. You know, keep keep it up. Yeah, it was that an area where failures are apparent uh, as raising your kids, I think. Um, yeah. Um, uh, you re you realize <laughs> well nobody does it perfect like and there's so many facts like everybody's like well if you put them around good people or if you send them to a good school or if you love them more or, or give them tough love or if you give them the, it, well, there's such a, like you think about your 18 years with your parents you know some more you know whatever there's a such a multitude of factors and there's no like okay if your childhood was good and it worked out for you and you became a good person there's no way possible to replicate all the conditions that occurred every second of your 18 years yeah. you know people the time frames the you know so like you know like nobody's like you're you're, you're gonna like you're gonna fail <laughs> a lot um but, but the part about like like you said with like parenting right so you know i'm a, a little bit older than you right so my parents were always working 
they never like took us out and like had play dates and all that kind of stuff. It was like, you know, hey, go play with the neighborhood kids. And then everybody in the neighborhood played together and we're, you know, a lot of us are still all friends like 40 years later, you know, but now it's like, oh, well, they didn't, you know, they're not spending this much time with me, this much time. And then you have like this parent guilt, like, oh, I got to be doing all this stuff. And am I a bad parent because I don't do all that kind of stuff? Am I failing as a parent? And I'm like, dude, I don't know if I saw my dad, like, you know, like my dad was awesome, love, a role model, awesome guy, you know, but he was working. You know, he'd come see our games and stuff like that, but it wasn't like, oh, hey, take you to the ball game, you know, take you here, go play catch and all that kind of stuff. It was like, you know, we made it to the games. We had family dinners and stuff like that, but it wasn't like, now looking back, I don't think that was like a bad parenting thing, but now it's like, you know, when you have kids and you see all this stuff on the internet, and I think social media and all that kind of stuff kind of fucking hyped it up or whatever, but it's like, don't feel bad because you miss one game. It's like, I don't know how many games, you know, you know what I mean? So the failure rate is, is well, especially if the reason, like if, if the reason is grounded in, you know, like you're working to, to better yourself, it doesn't even have to, it actually doesn't even have to be work. Like if it's going to the, I mean, you wouldn't miss a game to go to the gym, but you know, like just, just what is, what are you striving towards? Because, well, cause I noticed that when we did have some success, I was lounging around and laying in the pool a little and, I, and my thought there was like, well, what is that model for your kid? Like, okay, yeah, you sat in the pool all day and you were able to take them to the things, but they just saw a, a chauffeur as opposed to somebody <laughs> who had standards and is in the office and, you know, might have to miss a thing or two, but does everything they can to come to the games and get them to the things. They're seeing somebody who's driven and they're going to, you, you have to model the behavior you want to see. Um, but I think, I, I love that topic, but I, th I think it, it makes me, you know, I always love to bring up with with kids that the hardest part about being a parent is, and, and on the topic of failures, is letting them fail. Like, they, you have to, they have to experience the failure. You, if they don't, you're not equipping, like, you're not going to be with them forever. Like, they're going to become an adult and do their own thing most of the time. Uh, so, but my point with that is, is when they go out into that world, are you equipping them, you know, to, to deal? Cause like, you know, it's ugly. You see the shit we deal with as adults. You see, like, you've got it. You go to a hockey game in the city. You've got to navigate the bad streets sometimes. Like you got to know where to go. And if they don't know how to navigate that, because, and I like this analogy, if you always give them the GPS, like they're so reliant on the GPS in their car and the moment you take them away, they don't know what the, where the fuck to go. Like that's how it works. So you have to let them fail and make a few wrong turns. So they go, Oh, I need to read signs and know my North, South, East and West and know how to do it without the GPS. And, 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 and but that, but at the same token, that's one of the hardest things to do as a parent is to like willingly let them fail or acknowledge they're going to be in a position where they might you know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, my son is uh, 19, and uh, I got a call tomorrow, uh, yesterday at uh, like around lunchtime. I'm like, oh, you want to stop because he goes to college and all that kind of stuff. I'm like, he's like, oh, you're gonna stop in and have some lunch or whatever. He's like, no, I'm going to New York City with my buddies. I'm like, all right, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, like, all right, well, you know, hey, go have fun, right? And then you know, I call my wife. I'm like, hey, do you hear where he's going? You know, I'm like, you know, the big city, all that kind of stuff. Traffic's a, a mess. I'm like, well, you know, what do you think? I'm like, oh, he's got to learn, right? You know, he's going to be going to Philadelphia to Temple. He just got uh, accepted by them. I mean, you know, he's got to learn how to navigate big city life. And, you know, if he wants to go with his buddies and kind of learn that, I mean, be safe. But, you know, he's got to, he's got to, sometimes you got to scrape your knees in life, right? Figure out what's going on. Yeah. And I mean, I haven't experienced it at that higher level yet where they're older and it's like the stakes are higher. But, you know, I, I, my oldest um, was doing pretty well with things like she was like, you know, winning competition here, winning in like, you know, like or school, like getting first plays or go, moving on to the next thing. And, you know, and I didn't orchestrate this, but it was perfect. Uh, I, I had she had been doing well, just everything. Um and I, I came into her room one night and I, and I just knew she was on top. Like she just, everything had been going right for, for a while. And I said to her, I said, Macy, I'm going to tell you right now, you, we all fall. Like we all fall. You're going to get hit with a challenge. I don't know when it's coming, 
But let me tell you from experience, it is coming. And when you see it the least, it's when it's most likely to come. So I'm, 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 you're doing amazing, and I think you're awesome. But just be ready for when the world is going to knock you back down a peg. And like literally three weeks later, one of the things she moved on with, she she didn't move to the next round in school or whatever, you know, and it crushed her a little bit. I, I hope that that conversation helped like premeditate her for that. You know, I, I think it did. You never really know. But what I was so, I, I don't know if that was, I don't know. You never know what it is. But I, I you know, what I saw was her just like accept it, get humbled, but then go back and do the work. Like in, in other aspects, like whether it was softball practice, other things that didn't even apply, but like it taught that lesson. And like, I couldn't have orchestrated that any better. Like, I, like I'm not excited that my kid had, had a failure, but like I am, you know what I mean? Like well, you want to see, you know, if they have grit, you want to see, you know, they're going to pick themselves back up or, you know, how they're going to react to stuff like that. Because like I said, nobody's perfect. And if, uh, you know, we want to kind of go full circle and bring it back to real estate, right? There's all, like, 90% of your day is failure, right? When you, uh, what you call, put an offer and you don't get it, right? There's no second place in our business. You know, when you're making calls and you get that rejection, there's no second place in that, right? So how do you how do you kind of handle that failure? What's your message for your team for, you know, kind of coming full circle and saying like, hey, like, how, how, how do you overcome it? Yeah, so um, um, that's probably something where I failed a lot for a while on how to handle that with the team like perfect because like i personally just like i just chug along you know like, <laughs> so i'm just get very, back, up. Get back yeah. on the phone i'm very boring you know and i and i just expect other people to do what i would do so like for years i would just be like suck it up buttercup let's go like just get back let's like do it again you know just do it again and not all people do that um no no it's uh like I said, there's different personality traits. If we we're all the same in this world, it would be you know boring, right? Well, and to be clear, it's okay that they're not like like yeah, for sure. Because there's things about like just the way I do that isn't always good. Like that, you know, there's everybody's got good ingredients and bad ingredients. I don't care who they are. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it, it, I just because I definitely taught, especially on the shows, that like do the work and blah blah blah. And, uh, but like there's people that are better than me with different skills. Like I'm not, you know, the best. So like, I know I'm not like my way isn't always the right way, but, but what I, my point to that is what I learned was to lead people is to recognize that people are on a different journey than you are. And I failed at not recognizing that probably for nine out of the 10 years, like literally maybe only the last year that I realized um, because people, people leave people and I've had people leave uh, market. Sure. But, I've had people leave over the last year. Yeah. Uh, the lot of, a, a lot of them I know were because of bad leadership on my part. And you look and you go, well, what, what could I have done differently? Because I have personal responsibility, right? And I had to go internal and learn, and still learning, because like unconditional love, like loving somebody regardless of the circumstances and respecting the path that they're on and respecting that it's a different path and yours and respecting that they might want something different than you do so i like to answer that question like how i handled it up until this year like get back and do the work how i handled it now is we go through discovery if there's anything that we could have done differently and if there's nothing we could have done differently we left it all on the on the table i think going through the process of discovering that makes them feel good um it makes them want to roll the sleeves back up and go so i think it's a process of discovery as opposed to just do it. Yeah, yeah, like you said, <clears throat> not everybody's gonna have the same goals as you. Not everybody's gonna wanna lead a team of blah, 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 X amount of agents and try to scale it all the way up to whatever. You know, some people just wanna, you know, pay their bills or, you know, some people are doing a part-time and it's just their vacation money, so you gotta meet them where at. Like, I, yesterday we had our team Tuesday, uh, you know, calls and training and all that kind of stuff. And I said, hey, look it, you know, if you're getting to know, right, and you're making your calls and, you know, you're dealing with that failure and stuff, you know, I, I think switching the mindset on that, right? You know, one, one thing that helped me when I was first starting, you know, getting started and, you know, getting the rejection and I was an IT introvert, right? So rejection wasn't something that was natural to me. 
you know, people wanted to see me because I'm an IT guy. I'm going to come fix all your shit. And, you know, when I leave, everything's going to be good. So you're happy to see me, you know, so rejection and dealing with that didn't come natural. So like a, a, a quick mind hack that I had and, you know, was teaching the team this was like, you know, there's somebody out there that needs your help. All we're doing is just trying to find them, you know, and then just try to help them out with whatever situation that they got. And, you know, if you get that no or you get told fuck off or whatever it is, you know, hey, look at that person just might not have been ready yet or that person that might not be for us. You know, we're just looking for people that are looking for help. Dude, such a big one. And I've experienced that different ways. Like, you know, um, uh, first and foremost, they talk about here at Phil and Failures in the beginning. And I think most agents at some point get a CRM or use the broker CRM. And, and, and I've talked about this a lot where they get the unsubscribe or the stop. And just one of them crushes them. And like, I literally probably got 10 yesterday. Like I, th that has never, like that has kind of never phased me from the get go. But I will say, I didn't have the mindset from what you talked about where it's like, well, you're just looking for the person to help. So it's worth taking the people that you that weeding out the ones that, you, that don't want your help or don't see you as valuable to find the person that will. That is so big though. Like, because if you truly believe you can help, like even back when I didn't have all this stuff, like accolades or nav navigated a ton of sales or this unique marketing system in the beginning, I truly believed and, and still do that I would negotiate better for you than the agent to the right because I did. And, and like, I, I just, I, I thought I was smart. Like I, and I still, like, I feel like if I'm going to go buy, if I'm going to book a vacation, I'm going to get it cheaper than most people around me because I'm good at like, I, that's how I am. <laughs> that was the same skill set I found in real estate. So I'm like, if they work with me, I'll save them five grand compared to the next agent because that's just how I, because I'm, I work smarter. And that belief probably, maybe, maybe that's why I didn't care about the stops. But I'm telling you, if you're somebody out there that truly believes you can help somebody, then none of the rejection matters because those are just people that that aren't your 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 tribe like yeah. or your ideal customer as they say you know? I, I, i'm the unsubscribe baby though i i hate it when i see it i'm just like really? oh, yeah i am I I totally. i'm like the introvert it guy at heart and i'm like why wouldn't that person like that i feel like calling them right now and seeing what's up <laughs> but i but then I say, okay, on to the next one. I'm just trying to help people. So, but I, I, I'm not like that. But um, yeah, to kind of go back and, you know, talk about failures and stuff like that, right? So you can always use failures as, you know, motivation to get where you want to go. Um, you know, one of the homework assignments I gave uh, the team was, you know, write down all the objections that you think, you know, a potential home buyer might have a potential home seller might have, a potential investor might have, and, you know, kind of work on, you know, how could you be helpful on helping them? Because it, objections are really just people's problems. And if you can solve people's problems, you're going to be more successful, you know, as an agent or whatever in your life. The more people that you help, I mean, the more successful I think you are, you know, like I said, uh, just getting after it and approaching it from that mindset instead of, uh, oh, I failed. This person doesn't want to use me as an agent. It's like, well, you're going to have that no matter who you are. You know, some people just, for whatever reason, want to work with somebody else, and that's okay. You know, you just want to find the people. Like I, I always say, try to find the people that are sim swimming towards you, right, instead of trying to catch everybody that's swimming away. Same thing with team members on the thing. If they're not swimming towards kind of the tribe that I'm trying to build, that's okay. You know, maybe I'm not the best fit for somebody. Maybe you're not the best fit for some agents, right? You know, definitely. In like <laughs> a, in a month, I'm going to be in like a t-shirt and uh, flip flops. That's me. You know, I'm not the guy that's going to be you know trotting around in a suit, thinking you know, I'm fucking Mr. Big Shot, right? That's okay if people don't want to work with somebody like that. I want to work with people that are, hey, look, at, I'd rather get the value from you than kind of what you're dressed like. Like, um, you know, it was, it was funny. Uh, I was watching the Nashville uh, Maverick, and they're like, you know, like Chip Black and the other guy, I, forget, I think it was Brett, uh, and they're like, yeah, we're dressed like 22-year-old drug dealers or whatever. It's like, yeah, that's what they're comfortable in. You know, I'm comfortable in, like, T-shirt and flip-flops. You know, 
So I'm, I'm not changing to impress anybody. You know, if you are down with that, that's who I want to impress. So, you know, first failure I had was trying to be somebody that you're not, right? That's a hard one, you know. Oh, I got to dress up nice and be all this or whatever all the time. Uh, dinner's done. I just heard it thinking. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think the hardest thing is to be yourself, right? And the biggest failure I think people have is trying to be somebody that they're not. And like I said, it's, it's okay to be you. There's only one for a reason, and you're here for a reason. Well, and I, I struggled with that. Yeah, failure talk. Like, because and, and I struggled with it hard because it worked. Like, I played the salesman role for years, and like, it was pretty good. Not and not that I sold people things that they didn't want. I just I just morphed into what they needed. Um, and I always told them what they wanted to hear instead of what they needed to hear. And then once I learned the alternative to that, it's actually it's more powerful and it's less on your back. So I had a lot of personal issues that came from wearing that uh, mask for years of like who the people wanted me to be in in the conversation in the on the phone call. What just just constant right. And, and I'm still working at that every day because like that was like a like a knee-jerk reaction like because that's how I built this thing and it, and it rewarded me which was not good the candy was rewarding bad behavior at the time but then a lot of personal you the rope for sure move you jumped over the wrong rope <laughs> and that's what's weird is when you do get rewarded for bad things but you know karma or the chickens come home to roost or whatever the saying you want to pick and like you know I had a lot of personal situations that came up from that I think and I think that taught me like you're you're being a character and it's like the universe is telling you like stop being the character be yourself and when I learned that and I'm still learning it every day like it, it just gets a lot easier like right now sure I'm still dealing with a lot of hard things every day but like I am more in my authentic self than I've ever been like I like I always said this before, but like I quit college because of public speaking, talk about a failure, right? Like I was literally just scared to come into class to give a speech. It's essentially why I quit college. Like I had to give a speech the next day and I didn't want to do it. So I stayed home and played World of Warcraft. Woohoo, big moment, right? Yeah. Like, um, but um, now I'm like, li like, I literally don't care that we're live. Like I, this is, if Jason was sitting right here, man, like I'd be in the same boat. And, and that's, um, that that was learned from failing at being another character like like why did i not want to give a speech because i was being a, like another character if i just be me it's it's not hard to give a speech when you're you you know mm -hmm. what i mean well think about uh how many people would even be on the show or you know too scared to even you know come on live right because of the fear of what other people might think or whatever you know i i, I always hear that and it's like Dude, what, what do you give a fuck? What, what anybody else thinks about you? You know what I mean? Like, uh, Hermosi has a good line on it. It's like, in 50 years, we're all going to be dead. And you're going to care about somebody that probably not even thinking about you, what their reaction is going to be, and all that kind of stuff. And you worried about something stupid when it could you could have used it to elevate your life for, and your family's life for the better, right? Why would you why would you care? Now, if somebody's out there, like, kind of bad-mouthing you and something like that, that's a different story, but you know, think about all the things that we think internally, right? Oh, this person's gonna think I look stupid, or I might think I look too fat. I always tell the, I always joke to the team, I'm like, I get on the video, I got a face for radio. I'm like, fucking, you know, you just gotta get after it and kind of, you know, get over that, go to get over that hump. I, I want to hit on the what people think of you thing with social media real quick because I have a quick story for it that's super relevant. I I think I always feared that, but then I got over that fear and I had a long time on social media without really experiencing it. But then this past fall, and for those of you that have ever followed me recently, know that I've probably gotten a little bit more vocal and a little bit more of my true self has come out over the last six months than it ever has. Um <laughs> You stop drinking and the truth uh, spills out without the alcohol. <laughs> you're supposed to be when you start boozing it up. Then you're like, whoa, I got something to tell to you. So my point, though, people. my point, and this is interesting. So I know shit. This is true. And I don't know if I told you this, Jason. I'll have to, I'll have to send this to you after. I woke up one morning in the fall, this past fall, and I was just like waking up, scrolling on my, like, I think it was my Instagram, which I'm not even normally on. And I like saw a picture of myself and then I'm like, I scrolled back up and no shit. It was a screenshot of one of my posts with a, like a black line over my eyes. Like, 
and it was this guy that I met when I was in a band, uh, definitely a different place in my life. And just basically the post was like, you, like something like, you know, you can win if you go all in, like it's a lot easier to win if you just like commit and submit to the plan and hustle type, you know, mentality, obviously. And it was just tearing apart me and this hustle culture and, and all this stuff. I was like, I was like, holy shit, this is what it's like. This is what it's, and there was comments on it from people I never met and another thing. Like, I'm just like, what? I'm getting, I've never seen this shit before. I'm getting I'm social so shamed. Yeah. People are angry toilet tweeting at me. <laughs> I said that to you. I don't think I told, I didn't tell you this, right? I no, know. no. <laughs> so I was just like, what the fuck? Like, but it actually, I think, I think because I heard enough podcasts like this and just things like I'd already premeditated it and like I knew well and maybe authenticity like I knew that's 100% that post was 100% how I felt I wasn't being any character it might have triggered them that I believe in hard work and I, I like what would they what do you believe in like don't work hard yeah. oh the conditions suck and it's not fair well you'll never win that battle it's never gonna be fair the world ain't fair you know well, here, here's the thing when you're when you're putting yourself out there, you're putting a target on you, right? So it's a lot easier uh, for people to like point and say, oh, you know, what do they think they're so whatever. Yeah, you know, that's their opinion. You know, usually when people say something like that, it it's more on them than it is on you. You know, they kind of might want to wish, oh, I wish I had, could do that. Or I wish I was doing what you're doing on the beach and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, the door's open, you know, we're, we're, the reason we do a lot of this stuff is just to help people, you know, we're both natural givers like that, but it's like, if you're going to put yourself out there, be prepared for the haters, because you're going to get yourself some fucking haters, which is fine, you know, I'd rather, you know, if I could help one, like I texted you the other day, I go, we're here to help as many people before we croak as we can. And that's my goal. So if I have some people fucking hating on me because I'm doing X, Y, Z, or they think I'm this and that, dude, I'm, I, I tell the team this all the time. I'm Popeye. I am what I am. This is what you get. You know, when you first meet me and we, I tell you I'm going to help you, I'm going to help you. You know, I, there's no artificial, uh, you know, oh, he's a different guy from here to here. He said this and he didn't do that. You know, I'd rather be authentic and help people. And if somebody hates it, you know, fuck it. Yeah, hundred percent. So, well, and that and that's the thing. It's it, if you're scared to like get it out there, share your thing. Um, I guess it depends on your mission. But if your mission is to help others, you know, because um, people like to say they give back by making a donation somewhere. Well, I like to actually help somebody. Like, and not that there's anything wrong with donations, by the way. I think it's fine. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing. Not, but but me personally, I'm like, you know what? I'd rather make a human being become the best version of themselves as opposed to just pay a fee to feel good you know and not that donations again like i'm, I'm not trying to trash donations it's a good thing no. just, I'm, um it's a lot easier to just you know hey here's that and i'm going on my way than actually get in the weeds with somebody and kind of help them out right so the transition to finish this this episode i think the last thing i want to hit on is like and you kind of glossed over here. You talk about like, yeah, people see the things that somebody else has and they want them, but they don't realize the work. And we talk about that a lot, you know, so I am guilty of that. You know, I think like transparency in the spirit of transparency, like I built the team because I had it. I had a successful solo agent business. So I built a team and then I saw these people get this revenue share at EXP and I had a little, you know, and I was like, man, like, what if, it, what if I took it serious, you know, because they got it and they got it and it must be easy. They're living on an island and they're doing this and, you know, it must be easy. <laughs> must be easier than this team thing. Uh, and shifted focus towards that. And then from that went down a shiny object tunnel, as you well know, Jason, where we were trying to sell software and um, a digital marketing product um, to agents. Because it be And actually, in truth, because it solved problems for me, like it did, you know. So I saw the value of it. But what I didn't realize, first of all, I'm leaving an environment that I had championed and gone, gone through the hard, like, like building, you know, 
because you know we failed a ton of time. I failed a ton of times as a solo agent to become successful. All the rejection, all the lessons. I failed a ton of times as a team leader. I remember the first year we weren't like that much more prof. I was like less profitable than the year before when I was solo, right? Like you had to because you had to learn systems and processes. And people. My first couple teams were terrible. I just and it wasn't the team members. It was just me. I was a terrible leader. It was kind of just like one of those things where it was like, hey, I'll just figure it out. Like here's some leads, just go. You know, and there was no nothing you know now if team members that were on the team then were on the team now they'd be like wow this is like total night and day you know what right. i mean but that's progress right so eventually you know it's trial and fail right we messed up you figure out what didn't work and then you, you correct that and then you move on right and so exactly and i had all that stepped up but what happened was when i swooped over and goes you know i'm gonna just take revenue shares the, as the main focus I was a rookie. I was at the bottom again because that wasn't the skill that I built. You know, I didn't, I didn't, and that's going to take time. And I expected, well, I'll just do it like they did it. And that vessel is easier than this vessel. And because the compound effect or whatever the hell, and that didn't work. And then the software one was real interesting because I actually, and you know, I got it to a point where I literally was booking appointments in my calendar on autopilot, 20 or 30 a month on autopilot. It cost me $20 per appointment. So, you know, I mean, simple math, like, like and I'm actually, uh, is that, I'm just making sure I'm right here. Uh, so I had like four or $500 and I'd have like 20 or 30 people that were my ideal client ready to rock and roll. And I realized I don't know how to sell a pro. I know how to sell my services as a real estate agent because I've done that for years. I know how to sell my services as a team leader and coach because I've done that for years, but I don't know how to sell software. <laughs> I'd say, yeah. Okay, did it work out the way you want? Was it successful? Probably not the way that you wanted to, right? So if you want to chalk that up as a failure, go ahead. But my thought on it, and I told you about this, is it's like, dude, but you're just looking at it as a monetary thing. Look at all the skills that you develop now that you could take to future endeavors. Like Glenn Sanford has this where, you know, EXP wasn't his first fucking rodeo, right? How many things did he have that busted out? But he took the skills that he learned from all those other ventures and then got the one that hit. So it's never a failure unless you quit. It's true because, be, and like Hermosi will say, the work works harder on you than you do on it. And like, like, like you're right. Like, monetar but monetarily, it is a failure. Like, I, I think, like, if you, if you are emotionally intelligent enough to be able to handle like the reality and the truth, I think you should, like, I think the truth, it, it'll set you free. Like, it was a failure. It wasn't, uh, there was, pro I wasn't good enough for selling or the product wasn't good enough. Or the, there was a problem and it wasn't working. And that's, and, and money shows you it's not going well. Like, but, if nobody wants to buy your shit, it's a bad product. Don't do it. Like, you, you know, now you can get better at it or improve the product, improve the sales, blah, 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 through the marketing. But, Money will money is the ultimate accountability tool. So it did become a failure, but it's n like you said, it's not if you don't quit because now I come back into like the team environment. What got you here will get you there. And I have some skills. Like I understand digital marketing 10x, 100x what I used to. Yeah. You know? Well, here's the thing. You you're comparing the wrong metric, right? So you're you're measuring it as a financial thing. And it's like, okay, well, you know, that was not a good thing because I didn't hit this financial thing. But if you set your thing as, okay, I'm going to do this. And, you know, uh, the end of the day, my, what I'm looking for, my target is that I'm going to learn how to be the best digital marketer. And I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, recruit leads and I'm going to get my costs for ads uh, down and I'm going to have that skill. Then it was a success. You're just looking at it the wrong way. But the, but that's the learning curve, right? So yeah, but that was the goal. I just paid, I, I just paid all this money uh, to develop this thing, but, but you could say, okay, I, I just paid all this money to learn this skill, and that skill's going to oh, be moving on. That's how you have to look at it in in hindsight and in growth and in in the spirit of growing as a human. But like, it's still a failure in the sense that like the mission at the, of that was to make it a for profit business yeah. that I also learned in. But that I, you know, that that accompanied the other things that I was doing, you know, like it was, but it was supposed to be for profit. I wasn't doing it for learning, you know. Yeah. No, no, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, in that, we'll, like, we'll, we'll, we'll give it a, we'll give it a, you know, a little. All right. Do better no, next. It's time. A failure. Like it's a failure.
And no, if you it's, it's, all right, so bomb, big deal. It's a failure, and it's it, but it's when you view it positively, like you're saying, like it's okay, it's okay, but we can still call it a failure. We don't need to like bullshit, you know, yeah. like. Let me the fuck. People, I don't, I don't do well with the well. You try to, no, you, you failed. It's okay. Do better next time. Like work hard. Uh, maybe you should have prepared more. Maybe you should have learned more. Maybe you should have worked harder. Maybe you should have did something different. You know, like mm -hmm. that's yeah. okay. That's okay. Like, um, it's funny because <clears throat> you know Rick on my team is right across from me. And we just had this conversation for an open house that you know we was hosting over the weekend. And I'm like, dude, you're not here just to kind of open the door. I could have just fucking left the door open. You know, you're here. You don't want to be like, like I said, is it a failure? No. You got, you know, some activity and all that kind of stuff. We ended up selling the house out um, from those couple of days of activity. But it's like all the lessons that he learned now, now he's going to take all those things that, you know, could have worked better for the last one. And now the next one's going to be 10x what this one was. You know, so it's always a learning lesson and an opportunity to get better at anything. And, you know, he values that part of it. It's like, oh, okay, I never thought about that. But I'm like, you know, that's my end of the bargain is being the team lead. You're like, oh, what am I paying your splits for? It's like, you know, you're, you're part of the bargain, you know, work your leads, do the contracts, all that. Mine's to help train you up and coach you along the way so you can be better and better throughout the whole process. And, you know, provide the systems and processes to do that, right? So it's like, okay, my end of the bargain is to show you your weak spots, your blind spots, because you don't even know you're not yeah, doing because it. we fucked it up. <laughs> yeah, we fucked it up, and you know, like you said, we're nobody's perfect, but like you said, you, when you skin your knee, you figure out how. Okay, I don't want to do that again, and then you can tell people, hey, don't do that because you're going to skin your knee. My guilty trait, though, is trying to teach them every single time I skin my knee in a matter of five minutes, and I need to learn that nobody can absorb it that quick. You have to give it to them in small doses. <laughs> like, uh, you, you have to teach them, but you can't puke it on them. I, I've learned, I have a guilty. Uh, that's a guilty yeah. trait I have. <laughs> yeah, we just we were talking about that yesterday on our team call too. It's like you get so excited to have somebody on the phone that you're like machine gun mouth fucking, and you don't just shut up and listen to what they have to say and how you can help them because you're like so concerned about getting your little script or tie track out. It's like, dude, calm down, slow it down. Third person, be a person, and just talk to them like a normal person. I'm like. Well, today I saw you were clicking on these houses and I wanted to make sure that you're... it's like, what the hell? I'm like, would you talk to your friend like that? <laughs> no, you would not talk to your friend like that. So. It's something like if you have a trait. So I have that trait. And I think what helped me was I saw my mom do it. And I saw my oldest daughter do it where they ugh, plethora of information too fast. And I realized how I couldn't fucking pay attention to it. And I'm not, I don't. I don't feel like I'm dumb. I feel like I can absorb, you know, maybe I'm whatever. I just feel like I can absorb it. I, that's a skill set I feel I have. I'm not, I don't think I'm the best thing ever, but I do feel I can um, do that. And when they're throwing that stuff at me that fast, I'm like, I don't care if I'm, you know, Einstein, I cannot absorb what they're saying this fast like that. And, and then it makes you realize, wow, I do that. So, Maybe a little hack, or at least what's worked for me, is like get around people you know who are similar to you so you can see, especially when you have kids, you can see your, your character traits regurgitated back to you or record your calls, like throw your phone up. I mean, you know, whatever state laws or whatever, I, I don't know, you know, with recording, be legal, whatever. But if you're able to record yourself so you can watch yourself. And you'll start seeing what it's like when you're screwing up because that third person perspective um, yeah. It's so much better. Um, mm, yeah, for sure. You can't you can't fix what you don't know is broken, right? So you got to identify your blind spots, identify you know maybe things that you're failing at, and then you know work on them to get better for sure. So wrapping it up, I think that you know, I mean, failures, um, <laughs> like they you'll, you'll never like. By the way, even if you know they're valuable, because I do, I know they're yeah. valuable. You'll never willingly go into a failure. So like, just like, it's just, you're never like, I never went into, I had made failures before I did the software thing. And then I did the like, software thing thinking it was going to be the best thing in the world and become be like terrible, but it taught me so much. So like, you're never going to see them coming, but they're absolutely going to happen as, and you hear it all the time, but as long as you can 
understand that it's teaching you lessons that you will use as a stepping stone to the next, you know, the next thing, the next, and it might not even be in the same industry or vein or thing you're doing, you know, like for example, you can get into real estate as an agent, do all this and not sell many houses. But then when you go to buy your personal home, or maybe you go to invest, you know, uh, you know, in, in rentals or this or that, you have so much more knowledge and advantage than the person who hasn't been what you've threatened. There's just subtleties and nuances that you pick up through being a real estate agent. So even if you fail as a real estate agent, you're actually going to get, and I've always said this since, you know, I started the team is like you, even if you fail on this, you will save so much money when you buy your first home that it'll be like <laughs> Well, I, I think we fail as podcast hosts because we say that we're going to keep this to 30 minutes every week and then we don't shut the fuck up. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I look up at the clock and it's like an hour and I'm like, well, bombed on that one again. So maybe next week we'll keep it to half hour <laughs> bite sized chunks. Maybe we'll go longer. Maybe we'll pick what the yeah, script. We're going uh, Tim Ferriss. We're going three hour podcasts. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm down for, you know, you and I have talked about the way and, and it'll constantly evolve. There's no way that at episode 22, it'll be in the episode 100. It'll, it'll change. But I think that the nice part about this environment is it lets us workshop it out and you all can see what a conversation looks like because jason you and i have these conversations anyway and that was the spirit of this podcast was let's get these conversations out in the public so people can see what we go through the paces we go through and the people we are and hopefully that gains, gives value so i've yeah. seen some from it um if you hey we've made it to 22 we're the one percenters if y'all have gotten any value from this episode, shoot us a message, text, email, signal flare, find us on socials. Let us know um, how it's impacted you and um, how we can improve it because we're wanting to make sure it gives value to the audience that is listening. So, awesome. uh, Jason, any final words before we jet out? Like us, subscribe, share it. Like I said, give us some feedback. Anything that you guys want us to talk about or anything like that, hit us up, leave a message in the comments and, uh, yeah, if anybody wants to kind of talk one on one, if they're struggling with something, more than happy to help you out. Absolutely. That's the mission. So thanks for tuning in, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one. Peace.